I always appreciate when you have a text like that and you kind of mumble the response because you you can't shout thanks be to God with that kind of ending, you know, weeping and, and gnashing of teeth. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. May studied marketing. She had a couple of positions when she finally landed what she thought was the ultimate position in her career. She was a vice president of marketing for a regional rehab hospital. It used the gifts that she had and she was excited because she could buy into the mission of helping people recover from strokes and hip replacements and knee replacements. But she got into the system and she soon began to struggle a little bit. First, she, when she saw the organizational chart and she realized that there was a president and she was the second in command, that got her a little nervous because she thought that in a rehab setting, maybe somebody medical might be the one that would be second in command rather than just somebody in marketing. But she loved the people she worked with. They rallied around and she shared the story with me that in, it was a September of one year, that one of the staffs had a son who developed a rather nasty cancer. And he had to be treated at a regional children's hospital because it was so specialized. And the employees rallied around and they got the company to allow them to uh, give some of their sick time to her so that she could be with her son as he was several hours away. And all was going along well until they got into the beginning part of November, about this time of the year. When word came down from corporate that they weren't meeting their profit goal for the year. So the solution was this. The entire staff would work 32 hours a week for the rest of the year, and they could meet their goal. Now, the employee who was out with a sick son was using sick time that had been accrued. It was on the balance sheets. Everybody argued that she should be able to, but corporate said, no, we have a profit goal. She only gets paid for 32 hours a week. May said it was rough because she knew that that two months of 80% salary was impacting everybody as they looked to the holidays, and there was a number of families of folks who worked there that would likely not have much of a Christmas celebration. But she went along until about the third week in January. The third week in January, she got called into the office, and she was presented with a bonus check because they met their profit goals. It was $10,000. She looked at the check, and she took it, and she put it in the bank, and she told me later on she put a deck on the house, their house needed a deck, and she put the deck on, and then every time she went out on the deck, she realized that that was Christmas for all of the folks that she had been working with. And she talked to some people, she said, you know, I'm really bothered by this, and they said, well, that's just the way the world is, you've got to get used to it, that's the way the world works. And she couldn't. I don't know if you saw the statistics, but it is in some ways the way the world works. Um, the Congressional Budget Office, which is nonpartisan, it's a research arm of our Congress, issued a report in October. It made most of the newspapers about the growth in income. It's an interesting thing to look at. From 1979 to 2007, the top 1% of wage earners saw their income increase 275% with inflation accounted for. 1979 to 2007, adjusted for inflation, 275%. Now the top 20%, which would include that 1%, that group saw their income grow by 60%. The bottom fifth, the lowest 20%, saw their income grow by 16%. So there is this stratification that's taking place in our society. But we have a value around that that says if you work hard, you're going to do well and you're going to succeed. And that value that we have, that kind of Protestant work ethic, means that when we come to a parable like the one that's before us, we don't hear anything shocking and it seems to kind of affirm what we think about the world, right? The two servants uh, worked hard and they reaped well and they were justly rewarded. Jesus seems to posit that if you work well, you'll receive a return. Now, the parable, by the way, is a very familiar parable. As I shared with you, it's from this later section of Matthew. And it's one that we often use because of its placement. It always falls this week in the year of Matthew, so every three years this text comes up. 
It's not, it's not trumped by All Saints Sunday, which would have been last week, or Christ the King Sunday that's coming up next week. And a lot of churches are oftentimes doing stewardship appeals during this time. This is a great text. If you're a preacher and you're comfortable talking about money, then you talk about the talents and money, and it's great. And if you're a preacher and you're not comfortable talking about money, then, well, it's called a talent, so we'll talk about the stewardship of your gifts. I need to share with you, though, that this has nothing to do with your gifts, abilities, or skills, those things God's given you. This parable is all about money. A talent isn't a gift in Scripture. A talent was a specific measure of money. It's like a $100,000 bill. We can talk about it, think about it. It doesn't exist, but it is a measurable sum of money. Let me put it in perspective for you. A talent was 6,000 denarii. A denarii was a, a normal daily wage. So 6,000 days wages. Somewhere between 15 and 20 years work. Let's put it in perspective. At Ohio's minimum wage of $7.40 an hour, 40 hours a week for 20 years, it would be about $307,000. Some other scholars say it was a weight of 65 pounds of silver, and I've heard a, a, a talent described as much as $12.5 million. Whatever it is, it's a huge sum of money. It wasn't a sum of money that anybody would have had. And, and so when Jesus starts this parable and this teaching, the first thing I need you to catch is people realize those hearers from the very beginning that this is over the top. This isn't historical. It's a, a teaching moment. Even at $300,000 for a talent, the first ser servant is given the equivalent of $1.5 million. Some other cultural pieces that you need to know as we look at the context of the text. A uh, big family with household servants was probably the closest equivalent to a modern-day corporation. There was also some values in the culture that played themselves out. Um, they understood the economy in real different ways. You know, what happens when our government needs more money? We joke about this. They just print some more, right? That's what we say. It doesn't work quite like that, but to some degree it's true. In Jesus' day, there was a fixed sum. And they understood that if one person was to get richer, it meant somebody else had to be losing money. And so the culture of the day made making money too much money was considered a, an evil thing, a negative thing. And so what was very common was a trusted servant or slave who was elevated to the role of steward would be charged with the responsibility of managing and investing the master's money so that nobody could claim that the master was stealing the money from the poor. Because if the master was getting richer, clearly somebody, another rich person, it could have been a middle class person, or a poor person was losing that particular set of money because there was only so much wealth to go around. Now, we hear the parable as one where careful investing, the careful use of the money uh, brings about appropriate reward. There are some other norms I want to share with you that help us understand the text. First of all, they wouldn't have said, good and well done servant. That's the first offense in the text, by the way. Uh, the folks in Jesus' day would have been disgusted by hearing of that uh, kind of uh, uh, gain for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, the highest legal interest rate of the day was 12%. Don't you wish the credit card companies had that cap today? 12%. Um, doubling an investment would have been scandalous in the day. Uh, and the culture valued community stability, uh, everybody being taken care of rather than personal advancement, self-advancement, which is back to the reason why you would have a servant do the investment rather than doing it yourself. Matthew was written to a Jewish audience, and a Jewish audience knew, as Jesus would have known, what the Old Testament, their testament, the Torah, the law, said about what was expected. In Exodus 16, uh, Moses uh, has an admonition about uh, storing up surplus. Isaiah condemned those who were adding to their houses and farms of those around them. And there was a prohibition of taking advantage of the poor. The reality was that the only way to even double your money 
in five years, say that long, was through unscrupulous means in the view of the society and culture. So this is kind of the inverse of a traditional parable. A traditional parable in the parabolic form uh, begins with all of these things you can identify. You follow along the story, you go, uh-huh, 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 which is what we do today with this one. And then there's a twist at the end. Jesus starts this parable with the offense. All of these unbelievable, over-the-top sums of money and returns that one could never expect. Janice tells the story about growing up in Russellville, Ohio. Uh, up until she was in high school, there was the Bank of Russellville. It was finally sold, and there was a guy who owned the Bank of Russellville. And they joked about that, the, that whenever a farmer came in to seek a loan, before he would approve the loan, the, the, the bank president would get in his car and go out and see if he'd like to own that farm. We have that kind of system in place sometimes in our world too, huh? And we would say, oh, what a greedy person. And that's exactly what Jesus' hearers would have heard as he began to tell this parable. And then we get to this third steward. The third steward seems to be immobilized by fear. Fears the master, knows what the master can do, and so he takes the money, goes out back, digs a hole, puts the money in the hole to protect it. Now, it's kind of ironic because can you imagine the size of hole that it would take to put $300,000 in? I mean, the largest bill is 100 today. I mean, let's put it in perspective. But that was a culturally normative thing to do that was considered perfectly safe to protect the money, was to hide it. People do that today. My, grand, my Aunt Ruth, um, she's now living with my cousin, and my cousin jokes that when he goes to clean out her house, it's going to take years because she hides all of her money in books and mattresses and stuff. And he said he'll have to go through every page of every book in that house that's filled to the gills because otherwise he'll be giving away much of her estate. This servant comes under fire. And you and I might desire to have that kind of Midas touch, but the reality is we tend to play things a lot more safe, much more like this third servant, right? You know, waste not, want not, save some for the future, be careful, hold on to a little bit more so that, that I know that if something happens tomorrow, I'll be ready. The litany goes on and on. The challenge, I think, for us in faith is oftentimes we live out our lives much like that that third servant, we take it and play it easy and we worry and we, we uh, whatever it might be, it could be money, it could be uh, gifts too, we find ourselves in the backyard under cover of darkness, digging a hole and burying and not risking anything. The interesting piece though is the interaction between the master and this third servant, the steward. You know, the, 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 the steward says, you know, I was scared of you and the Master doesn't even address that. Instead, he really, really addresses is he says, well, you're just lazy and evil. I've heard those said in our culture, right? I was riding with a car with somebody uh, a couple months ago. We drove by somebody who was holding a sign by the side of the road, and we'll work for food. Well, look at that guy. So lazy standing there by the side of the road. If he'd just go out and get a job, he wouldn't have to beg for money. Uh, and then we get to the end of this parable. You and I, I think, really hate the end of this parable. You know, because the servant has the one talent that's been entrusted to him, pulled out of his hands and given one of the other ones, and he's cast out into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And you can almost hear the master saying, well, that's the way the real world works, huh? To those who have more, more will be given, but for those who don't have anything even what they have will be taken away. And that's the way the world works, isn't it, brothers and sisters in Christ? I mean, after, uh, not long after Jesus tells the story, he finds himself standing before the powers of the day. He speaks the truth, and he takes the consequences. He's dispossessed. He's thrown outside the city walls, and he's crucified. We groan when we come to this text. And we say, Jesus, where is the good news here? Where's the good news? Where is the gospel? Where is the grace? I want to pause for a second. I've heard a lot of sermons on this text. 
I've heard a, a, a TV preacher one time I happened to turn on, and he said, this is the text that will tell you that Jesus wants you to be rich. So pray for money. God wants you to drive... I don't remember what car he said. My warning to you is this. If anybody preaches on this text and they try to take the edge away, run away. If anybody says it's all about what you can get, run away. Jesus intended this parable to have an edge to it. And the context helps us understand and interpret it. Last week in the lectionary, our text would have been, if it weren't All Saints Sunday, the story of the ten bridesmaids. Five were ready for Jesus, the bridegroom, to return, and five were not. We have the parable this week of the talents, and the text next week, our last Sunday of the year, is the sheep and the goats, the story and account of judgment. It comes, as I said, during that period where the church was waiting, and it's a call and a reminder to be faithful in this time. It speaks to us just like it spoke to that early church, because we are still in that time where we're called to be faithful longing and waiting for that day when Jesus will return. Though we don't know it, where we meet Christ in the world is in those places where that third servant is cast, outer darkness. Jesus says, we meet Christ when we feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, welcome the stranger, clothe the naked, care for the sick, visit the imprisoned. Those are the folks in outer darkness. It seems, when you pair these up in a row, instead of chopping them up, that the third servant gets cast out precisely where Jesus goes. Today I have the opportunity to finish up our last of this fall series, uh, our sermon series on hungry hearts, looking at those things our hearts hunger and long for. And brothers and sisters in Christ, our hearts long for purpose. And the purpose is to be obedient and to be faithful in this in-between time, this waiting where Christ has already been raised, has ascended, and we're waiting for him to return and for the next kingdom to fully be realized. We have been charged in this time with purpose. And our hearts are filled and fulfilled when we follow Jesus into the most unexpected of places. For those are the places that Jesus likes to hang out. Our purpose is living into the upside-down, grace-filled, loving kingdom given to us by God. Amen. I invite those who are able to to please stand as we pray. Gracious Lord God, we give you thanks that you have indeed blessed us, that you have gifted us, and that you join us in the most unlikely of places. We give you thanks for the charge in this in-between time, the purpose you've placed before us to be your hands and feet. We give you thanks for your love that has claimed us and given us the kingdom. Be present as we follow as we seek to be faithful disciples. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As our praise team comes back, I'll invite you to join now in our uh, response. It's walk the word, and the words will be on the screen.